Beauty and Hode MD to our 2 p.m. session with some of these award-winning plastic surgeons that we are so fortunate to have here in Miami. Good. How are you guys? Good. Thank you so much, April, for having yes. us. Good. Thank you guys so much. So let's begin with you, Dr. Kariaga. We have three great panelists today. Dr. Kariaga is an award-winning plastic surgeon in Miami. He specializes in a range of body, face, and breast procedures by utilizing his extensive experience in all of these fields. Dr. Kariaga has gained a reputation for being a meticulous plastic surgeon with a powerful practice, Kariaga Plastic Surgery. Welcome, Dr. Kariaga. Thank you. Thank you so much, April. Thank you. Next up, we have Dr. Paul Durand. So Dr. Paul Durand is also of Kariaga Plastic Surgery. Thank you, Dr. Durand, for being with us today. Pleasure. Happy to be here. <laughs> Next up, we have Dr. Merricks. So Dr. Merricks is a breast expert with us in Hope Beauty. He's a board certified plastic surgeon. He graduated from Duke University School of Medicine, continued his training around the world with a residency in Cincinnati Children's Hospital, a top ranked US craniofacial pediatric center, as well as a fellowship training in Europe, Central and South America. Welcome Dr. Merricks. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. So let's start out. How's quarantine been for each of you? <laughs> it's been different. It's a whole new, whole new reality to get, get used to. Um, yeah. Professionally, we kind of discussed, we're all doing the same kind of thing, taking care of patients the best we can virtually to keep them safe and maintaining the, uh, our practices open for uh, necessary uh, care, patients that we, we, we need to follow up with or have acute needs that are non-elective, but mostly we're, we're at home taking on uh, new consults and having the, the difficult uh, discussions about when we can actually treat people. And then uh, I think on a more human side, we're all finding time to think about what's important for us in life and probably getting a little more exercise and, and a little more different activities than usual life allows. Great. Does anyone want to add in? Well, yeah, same, same here. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. As we mentioned earlier, it's just it's been sort of uh, we're not operating uh, for us. We've been doing it for uh, you know pretty frequently in the last you know several years. In my case, and it's just it's it's sort of a different uh, situation in your everyday things. But um, but overall, we try to keep up you know communication with patients virtually and. I think, you know, everyone's been very receptive to doing this. I think everyone's sort of on the same page, both, you know, us as surgeons and our patients trying to stay in the same, uh, you know, social distancing uh, uh, type of scenario and trying to, to each do their part. Absolutely, I agree with both Drs. Durand and Marks. Very good. It's sort of a surreal time. It's a little time to, to work on ourselves introspectively and and sort of take a breather from life. You know, we gotta always look at the, the silver lining, um, you know, with, with the hope, the very optimistic hope that we'll be back in just a couple of weeks, um, you know, and, and it's gonna be very busy. We're gonna have a, a lot of uh, backlog of patients to not only to see as far as follow-ups and consultations, but also surgeries, you know, this has been still, even though um, we're, not una we're unable to really see patients um, electively, we're doing a lot of virtual consultations. People are still programming, you know, booking surgeries, choosing their dates. So this is going to be hopefully what is the sort of calm before the storm once we reopen. So I'm really trying to take advantage and just relax and, and do some, you know, personal introspection. Right. So that really plays into our next question uh, for you all. What changes have you adapted to your respective practices throughout this, this crazy time that we're in? So it's, it's been a, a quite a fast evolution, but where we all landed is where we have to, taking care of patients the best we can virtually. So a lot of us are spending time in our home offices, sitting here taking care of patients. And um, really, um, I think everyone's just looking, looking forward to try to think positively about the opportunity resting in the crisis, and that is to reorganize our thoughts personally, 
our business thoughts and restructuring, getting um, getting ready to be better than ever when we come back, stacking up our, our patients, making sure people are, are not lost in the tracks. And we've probably becoming stronger technologically through this is one of the basic changes, but it's, a, it's a really, for me, a time for complete overhaul. Absolutely, I agree with Dr. Marks. I'm using the time to uh, change procedures and protocols in the office, how things are done, work on paperwork, um, do virtual consultations, talk to follow-ups, have them send pictures. Um, you know, so, so there's always a lot of, you know, we, we're surgeons, the three of us, our favorite thing is to be in the operating room. Paperwork and administrative stuff is, is probably lower down the list of favorite things to do. So, so, you know, really having some time just to do all these things and, and you know, get them sort of streamline our practices so that when we go back, you know, we'll, it'll be even better and more efficient. I agree. I think almost, you know, always we always have an excuse in terms of, you know, following up on, on the, you know, everyday things. And, and this is a time that we actually, or at least I personally don't have to excuse um, in terms of, you know, being too busy operating and that kind of stuff. So it does, um, you know, force you and actually sits you down and makes you rethink things. And, you know, I'm actually thankful for that. Obviously, you know, I want to operate. We want to go back, I think, the three of us. Uh, and we want to, you know, get busy quick as soon as we go back. And I think it also takes a lot of planning to do that. And, you know, in terms of pre oping in terms of making sure everything's in order, the ORs have to be perfect as usual. Um, and we want to make sure that, you know, everything is ready to hit the ground running. I think. Right. What type of decisions have each of you, you know, had to face or had to make in the midst of all of this? Well, I think it, during the initial evolution, we were all wondering, do we stay open? Do we close? How do we handle this? And, uh, you know, I wake up every day considering when is it going to be reasonable for me to do some of the more non-surgical things that are a big part of my practice. So uh, a huge part of my practice is, is some non-invasive treatments and fillers and people are really chomping at the bit and daily I get phone calls, can't I just come in? Um, because there's, there's like this balance between uh, respect for the situation and the, the craving for normalcy. And a lot of people are kind of ignoring the crisis out there and want to just come in and get things done like they go pick up food in these days. And it's, it's personally tough on me because I obviously want to treat people. I want my business to run and I miss making people happy and seeing transformations. Um, their direct barrier to doing it really isn't there. I can, I can go to my office and do it. It's just waiting for the climate to be right. I don't know what your thoughts are, Dr. Ferrer. Absolutely. And the, one of the hardest decisions was, well, when, when do we close? You know, in the beginning, we were hoping that this was not going to be, you know, as, as big of a thing as it turned into um, and that we wouldn't be as affected here. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, that didn't turn out to be the case. So, so pulling the trigger as to when to cancel elective surgeries um, was a difficult decision. Now, of course, it's when do we start again? So, so it, every day, just take it on a day by day basis, see what news is coming out, see the trends. How are the new cases coming up? What, what's going on? Um, I, I feel and I think that, you know, a lot of the experts are saying that we're sort of at the peak of it. So hopefully from here it goes down. Um, so hopefully it won't take too much longer before we're able to sort of, I don't know about functioning normally. I think it's going to take time before we're back to completely normal. But being able to perform elective surgery, we're sort of in a much more controlled environment. So, we're, you know, we as plastic surgeons have always had a very big concern for sterility, for antisepsis, because to us, an infection is a catastrophe. So our offices and our surgery centers are always like spick and span, perfectly clean. You know, everything is disinfected between patients because we had never wanted to run the risk of a patient getting an infection because for us, it, it's, it's really a catastrophic problem because it can really alter the result. Um, so we're sort of used to it. So being able to do elective surgery again, you know, we sort of always, always have that mentality in mind that we have to make sure that a room is sterile, you know, is completely sterile and, and disinfected between patients. So we'll be able to do that and, and with minimal risk to patients once that curve has really flattened out and we're sort of on the downward side of the, of the bell. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think the, the biggest thing for me is, is the unknown, you know, and we, we went over that a little bit initially in terms of 
when to you know stop doing elective cases. Obviously, we you know, we couldn't and we can't close fully because we have you know there's always patient follow up and post operative uh, patient care that that is not elective that it's something you have to do if you've committed to a surgery you gotta see through the patient um, through the recovery. Uh, but I think you know now that the tough part is not knowing and I think we're all in the same boat. I think, you know, regulatory agencies are also in the same boat in the sense that we don't know uh, when is it going to be okay to do it um, in terms of a regulatory standpoint. And, you know, I think we have some idea in our heads and we're planning to do that in terms of how we're going to reorganize the flow of the practice, flow of the patients, take all the necessary precautions. And, and that honestly is not as complicated because we, we do take, um, care of that, you know, early on or can plan that. And I think the hardest thing is when you have a patient that asks you, hey, so what, when can I do my surgery? I've been waiting for a long time, or there's a backup, and, and, and they're really excited to get this procedure. Some patients have been waiting their whole life for it, and we gotta sort of be like, hey, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. And, and I honestly, you know, I think the three of us, we just don't like telling patients that we, we don't know that. And, and we're all in the same boat, we just gotta be honest, and and sort of wait it out and just be strong when we started it. We touched on this a little bit, but what about in office operational hours? So we're only seeing patients, um, the, the, what are we called the essential post-operative patients. So they're the patients that we operated on up until sort of the, the middle of last month, um, two days a week for a couple of hours. Um, and then the rollout will eventually be once we feel that the curve is really starting to flatten out and that it's gonna be safe to operate in a few weeks, we'll probably start adding more onto that to start seeing some of the longer term post-ops and then start doing the pre-ops with the ultimate goal eventually to be that once we're able to safely perform elective surgery, all of our pre-ops will be ready for surgery. So we're doing this out of concern for safety, not only for our patients, but also for our staff, our, basically our extended families, our employees, we don't want them to be exposed unnecessarily to to any you know to the virus. So so it's going to be a gradual reopening, just like it will be for the rest of the country. I think in pretty much almost every industry, it's not like there's going to be one day where it's bam, we're back to normal. So it's going to be a, a gradual sort of a soft reopening. Yeah. So I mean, we we've weaned down to as needed, and it's been a week by week change and day by day. If there's a patient that needs to see me. This afternoon, I'm going to be in the office. If there's a patient that needs to see me tomorrow, I'm going to be in the office. Um, so it's kind of a, a flexible, dynamic thing as needed. And then again, uh, as things start changing, we've what we've done is we've booked like the the patients that are um, really demanding uh, non-invasive filler interventions. We have a priority list that we're um, uh, accumulating there. So who comes in first as we're allowed to. And I imagine that's going to be um, a one at a time kind of thing. So uh, it's going to be just a different way of doing business. And of course we're booking cases and the way we're doing that is we're booking first week back, second week back and giving people priority like that. And who knows in a week we could tell those people when our first week back is, when our second week back is. Um, so basically just, just uh, um, letting people schedule with the, flexible date and really eager to get back to it, but it's going to be a new world and we're not, we're, none of us are going to run our, our offices exactly like we did before. Although everyone on this conference has more of a, a boutique patient centric uh, type practice. So none of, no one on this, on this panel sees hordes of people. So there'll be subtle changes. But we're definitely not going to try to have much overlap of, of patients. I think that's probably what everyone's thinking. Yeah, but I completely agree. You know, Dr. Craig and I will obviously have the same practice and and um, and we're taking it very, very similar to Dr. Marks in terms of being very flexible. Uh, most patients are very flexible also, and we're thankful for that. And everyone's sort of in the same boat, I think, in trying to, you know, resume practices in the safest and best way possible for, for patients. What about assisting? Are you guys doing anything to assist with um, the pandemic that we're in the midst of, with hospitals or any kind of initiatives? So we're on staff at several hospitals and we've sort of been in communication with the hospitals to see if we're needed. Um, as of right now in Florida, it hasn't been an issue. There have been plenty of intensivists, 
um, hospitalists that have been available. Our hospital system has been running uh, essentially at about 50% capacity in the state, um, which, which is good because we, we really haven't had that dire shortage that we've seen in other parts of the country like New York, um, where, where they really have a shortage of hospital beds and providers. So, so we've sort of made ourselves available um, if it's needed. However, you know, it hasn't been quite as overwhelming to the hospital system in Florida as was originally anticipated. And of course, hopefully that won't be the case. Yeah, we're, we're standing by similarly in that we've um, added equipment uh, to the registries should that dire need come. Um, and of course, everyone here is, is a physician that, that is willing to help out. Although I think that a patient's much better off with a daily intensivist than any of us running their, their intensive care unit. If it comes to that, we'd be there. But for the time being, luckily we're not needed. I agree. Just being part of all you know, different hospitals that we're uh, staffing, I think that's part of your obligation. And you know, as a physician, uh, first and foremost, before a plastic surgeon, and uh, we're available. Uh, you know, I personally have been in contact with them, and and um, if there's any need, they would let us know. Obviously, you know, as Dr. Mark says, you know, the intensive is probably better off, you know, running your your ventilator or your ICU. But in general, we do have, you know, some of that training, um, you know, in our general surgery days and that kind of stuff. And I think it's important to, you know, just be available. Uh, you know, thank God we haven't had that issue in Florida. Um, and like there are other places like New York, et cetera. And um, if we, you know, if it keeps that way, I think, you know, we should be good with just, you know, the amount of people in hospital staffs right now. Very good. When we come out of this, what are you guys expecting? Any kind of long-term effects, any kind of long-term changes that you'll make based on some of the adjustments that you've made during this period of time? I think people are going to be extra cautious for a while. I think that it's going to be more common even once this is over to see people walking around with masks um, and just, you know, taking more caution about washing their hands and where they go and avoiding like large places, large gatherings like concerts and sporting events. I think that it's created a sort of a very, this is a traumatic experience really for everybody in the world. Um, and, and everybody's going to have, to some effect, a little bit of PTSD about it, sort of almost how people were a little afraid to fly after 9-11. Or um, I actually lived in, in the D.C. area when the D.C. sniper was there, and, you know, that sort of changed people's psyches for a while. You know, the reality is that this is a big trauma, and I think that psychologically it's going to affect us for a long time. I think that in plastic surgery, I don't think that it's going to have a long-term effect um, people are still going to want to correct their, their issues. They're still going to want to look younger, feel younger. So, so I don't think that this is going to have a long-term effect on, on our specialty. Um, but I think that definitely this, the psychological uh, damage that it's, it's causing hopefully won't take too long, but I think people are going to be a little bit more cautious for a while. The question was on, on what, what the landscape's going to look like afterwards. Um, time will tell. I think that, you know, we're, um, I think it's going to be longer than we want to think. Uh, I think it is for, for surgical stuff to get really back to normal, but the demand is there. I get requests for revision rhinoplasty and things like that daily. Everyone wants to come in for um, fillers, like what I call aesthetic facial balancing. People are at home and they're looking at themselves and thinking about these things. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. I thought it would have a bigger impact immediately, but I, I agree completely with Dr. Car what Dr. Carriga said in that um, the demand is there and people are going to come. There's going to be uh, some economic consequences for some sectors of the population, but um, I think slowly we'll get back to uh, our steady states um, and what we do. Yeah, I think it's just going to be a gradual process, uh, definitely. And I think, you know, it's been, honestly, from my end, surprising, you know, the, the virtual consultations um, of the willingness of people still wanting surgery and, and carrying out with all this. And, and that, you know, that's great. And that I'd be, you know, we're all going to be happy to take care of these patients as soon as we're able to. Um, but again, it's going to be a gradual process. I think it won't be from one day to the next that everything's going to be normal. 
And I think as long as we're all aware of that and try to strive for um, you know, getting things done and getting things done properly, I think we'll be able to. What about advice for other practices? What sort of advice? You guys are real leaders here in Miami. So, I mean, it's definitely, you know, you don't want to be the practice that is opening and seeing patients now because it, I think that you're going to be looked at as sort of disregarding your employees and patients' health. Um, we sort of all have to do this collectively. You know, we sort of all have to agree. Now is a time where we feel it's safe to reopen um, so that we don't put our employees or our patients, uh, you know, their lives and their, their health at risk. So, so it's just, you know, as much as a lot of us are itching to go back to, you know, operating and seeing patients, we really have to have the patients, no pun intended, to make sure that we're going back at the right time. I think it's a lot of patients and a lot of day by day. Um, our society has, has preemptively put a lot of information for private practitioners on how they can transition outside of solar practice because there will be a lot of practices that uh, cannot survive this and have to kind of regroup. So I guess from an advice perspective, it's really time to, to do some accounting things and think about what's reasonable and what's gonna make the most sense in the new world because it is in some degree going to be a new world and there, there will be um, some, some thinning of the herd in, in all industries. So um, really, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, where, to put, um, where to put business funds and how to plan and how to push forward and what's reasonable. And I think it's just, you know, what, whatever, whatever practices want to do to try to look at really what, what their uh, mission statement is, what their, what their goals are, and how they want to proceed. Because it's a, it's a chance to reset and really think somewhat strategically, but also just to reset and set out a path that everyone's comfortable with. Yeah, I completely agree with both of you. I think, uh, I think every practice is different in terms of size. And you know, before all this happened, um, you know, in terms of patient flow, you know, every practice has been you know, set to a very specific uh, approach to patients. And I think it's honestly a hard question to answer in generalizing things, I think. Uh, but however, I think everyone has to sort of be on the same page of when to reopen again. Um, everyone has to be able to do this, you know, in a safe manner, um, you know, respecting the, you know, whatever guidelines we get. Um, and we know these guidelines are changing every day, you know, for everything regarding this virus. And I think um, every business, you know, uh, has to take, it, uh, you know, this into account and be able to do it safely. So we have a question um, from Kamal Hachandani. He's Hope Media Group CEO. Hello, Kamal. Any procedures or products that you're seeing that are in greater demand right now during this quarantine that, that are happening right now and what you foresee to be after we're out of this? There are a lot of people. I mean, there's a huge demand for filler interventions right now. People are home looking themselves. And then the interesting thing that I've seen is that revisionary work. So I've seen a lot of people reaching out for revision rhinoplasty, revision breast work, and revision labiaplasty because there's, there's um, uh, I guess when you're at home and you're in normal life, you're dealing with a suboptimal surgery, there's lots of other distractions, but when you're at home, you kind of think about the things that are bothering you. So I've seen more revisionary work popping up and then just kind of almost everyone wants a little filler cheek, a little, a, a little filler treatment, a tweak, a little cheek lift, um, asking around the area, about the area around the eyes, wanting to look a little refreshed because they're at home, they haven't been putting on makeup, they haven't been feeling great, and they want that little kind of uh, pick me up. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Marks. I think that, you know, the people that had their last Botox, you know, right before the holidays for, for, you know, to look good for Christmas and New Year's, it's starting to wear off. And people are, you know, looking at themselves and saying, uh, where did these crow's feet come from? So, you know, the fillers um, do require maintenance. You know, fillers, Botox, they do, there is maintenance involved. There, is, there are schedules that people adhere to very religiously. Um, and, and sort of they're, they're already like, you know, calling and very itchy to come back and say, hey, when, when can I get my next, you know, uh, Botox or where can I get my next uh, filler? 
So um, surgeries, you know, is surgery for most people, it's a once in a lifetime thing. So, so it can sort of be pushed back a little bit, you know, it doesn't really interfere with anybody's timeline. Um, but the fillers, you know, they do require maintenance. They are a regular thing. So, so we're definitely going to have a backlog of filler for a while. Um, and then, of course, you know, the more people that go booking surgeries, um, you know, it does create a longer sort of waiting list. So, so that'll be something that we'll, we'll address once we reopen. It's the same thing. I think apart from, from those, you know, minimally invasive procedures, I think part of it is, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of consults in terms of facial stuff. And I think, as Dr. Marks mentions, it's just people have more time to look at themselves and there's some things that bother them. Uh, there's obviously, you know, a lot of people that, you know, wanted to a certain extent use the quarantine to recover from procedures. And uh, obviously, you know, it's hard turning people down from that end and being like, hey, we can't, you know, unfortunately do your procedure and do, it would be a great time for you to recover, et cetera. You're not working, you're staying at home, et cetera. But obviously, you know, wouldn't be exactly, you know, fully responsible to go ahead and do big procedures right now. Um, you know, if, you know, we shouldn't be doing anything elective, you know, in terms of regulation, that kind of stuff. So I think it's going to be, it, it's great in terms of being able to, you know, get back to it as soon as we can safely do it. Uh, but I think in general, I think there's, you know, a little bit um, more time we have to wait for that. Talk us through the virtual consulting process. How does, how does that work? So the virtual consultation is a great tool and, and we've always used it um, to see a lot of patients because we do see a lot of out of state and even out of country patients. And the last thing we want is for somebody to have to, you know, come down, have a book a flight, book a hotel to come see us and for us to tell them, well, you're not really a candidate for surgery. Um, so, so for our out of town patients, we've always sort of started the process with the virtual consultation. And it's basically a three step process where the patient makes contact with the practice and then they're giving instructions on how to take good pictures and send them to us. And then we, the surgeon, review the pictures and we'll call the patient and talk to them about what are their goals, what are their concerns, and then see what are the options available to them. Take them through it step by step. And then a patient coordinator calls them to go over all of the sort of the more uh, logistic parts of the consultation as far as scheduling, pricing, um, financing, and then the patient can book their surgery um, with the understanding that they still will have to come in for an in-person consultation before the surgery takes place. Um, the other option that we've seen having a lot of requests is using Zoom just like we're doing now where we can actually see the patient face to face and but still go over the same uh, concerns. You know, we still address all of their, their issues and talk to them about the surgery, take them through it step by step, and then they talk with one of our coordinators. Yeah, so similarly, the virtual consultation process has been a part of uh, my practice similarly for really since its inception. I mean, we get a lot of uh, people that travel both, both domestically and internationally. So the, the key important features are getting some decent photography and making sure the patients are taking good pictures so we can analyze what we're looking at from multiple dimensions. Um, I'm also using Chrysalix, which is a 3D technology that's available for patients to take their own pictures and upload and kind of, we can morph those images. Um, but the, the only thing that's really different now is in most of my um, virtual consultations before the, this crisis, I, I, w I wouldn't do a live feed video consultation with the patient. I would rather just the same kind of process that Dr. Perry talked about as far as patient education, getting the proper photos, setting up a phone consultation, doing the medical screening, giving the patient options, referring them directly to examples of what we're talking about, and kind of going through and selecting what the patient wants, booking the surgery, then making arrangements for the patient to come in person. The difference now is that um, in the world of COVID, everyone's been so video centric that I am having this kind of face to face with patients which is really nice, actually. I actually prefer it, and it's, it's no substitute for the direct patient interaction, but it does kind of fill the hole a little bit there, and um, it's kind of fun because you're able to help people from a long distance, and some of the people that are calling in for virtual consultations, it's they have concerns that really don't need to be treated, so it's a little satisfying to be able to put someone's concerns to rest 
it's not booking a, a case or booking a surgery, but I've, I've had fun connecting with people who think there's some big aesthetic problem or some complication of the surgery that's not, not really something that needs to be treated. So um, at least it, it makes me feel more doctorly to connect with patients like that. The, the process is the same. Yeah, I think it's nothing new. You know, we've been doing, the three of us, virtual consultations for a while uh, for those out of town, out of country patients. And, you know, that hasn't changed. Um, and Dr. Carriaga already sort of mentioned the process in our practice of what patients need to do to, you know, get a virtual consultation, get booked, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, patients appreciate it. I, I think part of the initial patient and patient doctor interaction is a lot of it, you know, really, you know, seeing what the patient you know, is thinking about what their needs are, what their concerns are, um, and also, you know, offering a little bit of our expertise in terms of education and sort of letting them know what, you know, can and cannot be done, what's realistic, what's not. And, you know, a lot of times, as Dr. Mark mentioned, people don't need surgery, and it's, you know, our job to, to tell them that. And I think it's nice to be able to do it, uh, you know, virtually, not necessarily having the patient come all the way here for that. Uh, but at the same time, there are restrictions in it. You know, there's nothing like being able to, you know, speak to a patient, you know, in person, being able to examine them in person, being, uh, being present in that. And so it's going to be, you know, it's no substitute, but it's, it really makes a big difference, I think, and, and people appreciate that. And, and one, of the keys, one of the keys that patients really want to look for, because this is sort of the start where they get to meet us and decide if, if we are the person that they want to trust with their, with their lives and with their results. Um, one of the red flags that people do need to be aware of uh, is, of course, when you're doing a virtual consultation, really the first person that you should be speaking with is the surgeon. So if you're calling an office and they're just putting you on with a patient coordinator and they're telling you, well, you need a breast augmentation or a liposuction or this or that, and giving you a quote for it, that, that's, that should be a big red flag because the surgeon is the one that is ultimately making the diagnosis, recommending what procedures are necessary or, or, or not, and then giving you advice and explaining to you. Um, and that's not something that can be you know, uh, uh, given over to a, a coordinator, a patient coordinator is there to, to do the logistics of the consultation, not to talk about procedures. So, so a big red flag if, if you're calling a practice and they're telling you just talk to the coordinator. What about for first timers? You know, trying to choose the right doctor for their procedure. What's the value in being board certified? What should someone be looking for? So I think Dr. Carriaga just highlighted a, a, a key point in what he just said in that looking at the kind of practice, there's lots of different kinds of practices. There are business for kind of factory kind of practices. And there are practices with doctors that have dedicated skill sets that care about their patients, that care about results. And if I was uh, shopping, if I was a patient, I would try to look for that. Make sure you have a, a, a um, doc that ideally is board certified in their core specialty. Everyone here is a board certified plastic surgeon. We're all gonna say that's the ideal. Um, but the individual patient has to do their, their own due diligence and, and it's partially feeling who you're comfortable with, but making sure the skill sets uh, there before and after is help because there's all kinds of different aesthetics to make sure your aesthetics are aligned with the practitioner you're going to. If you have a very natural sensibility and want a breast augmentation, you don't want to go to the guy that has these big round boobs on his, on his website, his or her website. So um, I think being aesthetically aligned and then doing some basic due diligence and then uh, look at how you're treated because it's the, how you're treated initially in the, in the phone consultation is probably going to be uh, pretty cohesive. And what's going to happen throughout the procedure? Is, is this doc, do you trust this doc to pay attention to all the small details? Um, so there's a lot, a lot going on and there's a lot of uh, digital jockeying right now so it's a little bit of smelling out the sales pitch from the, from the true surgeon that's gonna take care of you. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, those are all excellent points. Um, and to add to that, I think the, the background and the training is something, you know, very important from a, you know, that a patient needs to look at. I think, um, 
not everyone knows this, but there's a lot of uh, surgeons doing plastic surgery procedures that are not plastic surgeons, or some are not surgeons at all. Um, not only here in Miami, but throughout the country. And, and it's hard, honestly, for a patient to, to realize that because they really sort of have to read between the lines. And, and I think, and that's why I encourage patients to ask your surgeon directly. And, you know, no surgeon that, you know, everyone should be, and I think everyone here is proud of their training and what they've achieved and the hours they've put in and the certifications they have, et cetera. And I think, you know, if you have a surgeon that doesn't want to share that with you, um, I think that's also a red flag. And I think as a patient, it is your, you know, right to be able to uh, ask, you know, your surgeon directly what their training is. Uh, have they done formal plastic surgery training? Um, how many years have you done this? You know, what are the dates? You can be as detailed as you want. And, and none of us, I think if a if patient would ask that uh, of us, we would, you know, hesitate in giving, you know, that specific answer. And I think it's important and I constantly encourage patients, even people that come see me and, you know, a lot of patients are shopping around and they're seeing this multiple patient, multiple uh, surgeons. And, and I tell them, hey, you know, there's very good people out there, um, but at the same time, there's very, you know, poorly trained surgeons and a lot of, some of them are not even plastic surgeons. And it's important uh, for them to make that distinction between before trusting, you know, your body and the procedure and your safety um, to your surgeon. Absolutely. So most of our patients come through word of mouth referrals from other patients. So a friend or a family member had surgery with one of us and now they're telling their friends they're happy with the results. So that, that's usually how the process starts. And then really the best thing that that person can do is start doing their own research, going online, looking at our website, looking at our results to make sure that those are the type of results that they see themselves having. Going, looking at the overall trend of the reviews, what prior patients are saying, what was their experience like. Um, looking up our credentials, our training, our certifications, um, looking up your, you know, your physician's license, making sure that they don't have any sanctions against their license. So, so there's a lot of due diligence that goes into this that every patient should do, just like you do when you're buying a car or when you're buying a house. This is one of life's big decisions and it really deserves the, the research that you should do, regardless of who you're choosing for your surgeon. And then ultimately, the most important part of it is the consultation. You have to be asking yourself, do I trust this person with my life? Because you are putting your life in that surgeon's hands. So, so a word of mouth is a great place to start, but always take it with a grain of salt. Just because your friend had a great result with a surgeon doesn't mean that they're the best surgeon to do your surgery. Um, like I said, you know, a, a cosmetic surgeon will every once in a while get the result right, but with the experience and training of a, a plastic surgeon, you know that you're going to be in the best hands. How do you how do you think someone can best utilize this time that we have right now and prepare for upcoming surgeries, procedures? Well, like we've been talking about, it's a great time to have uh, virtual consultations um, and get that data and do your, do your basic doctor shopping. Um, and then it's, you know, it's time for reflection. So the, the question that comes up in some consultations is, well, should I have this surgery? And that's a really personal, personal, personal um, decision. So it's time to think about that and do research, plenty of time to research. And then um, the resources are there. Most of us do have time to take on um, uh, new consultations here and give you a little, little piece of our mind and you can benefit from our experience, whether or not the patient decides to move forward with surgery. Um, if it's on your mind, this is a great time to kind of data collect. I agree. I, th I think another, uh, you know, point there in terms of preparing for surgery, if you're planning on having it uh, done you know, in the next few months or you, you know, put a deposit in or scheduled, um, you know, tentatively scheduled surgery, you know, it's always important to stay healthy. I think, especially nowadays uh, with what's going on, I think, you know, that's another reason to, you know, not smoke, you know, you know, don't drink excessively. Um, you know, have a well-balanced diet, exercise, that kind of stuff. But, you know, in general, before any surgery, all that helps, I think. And, you know, 
you know, take this as, you know, uh, an actual goal of trying to be healthier, prepare yourself, have a well-balanced diet. Um, and I think that all helps in terms of your body healing after surgery. So it's a good time to do that. Absolutely. I agree with both Dr. Sarand and Marks. Now is the time to really make personal improvements. One of the most important things that we're hearing about is that the people who are having a higher rate of complications with this virus are smokers. And we as plastic surgeons probably harp on our patients as much as cardiologists and pulmonologists that you cannot smoke. And none of us here in this conference today would ever operate on any smokers. So smoking is horrible for your lungs, it's horrible for your heart, and it can really increase the chance of having complications in surgery. So we really recommend people to quit smoking. And obviously this is a very stressful time, so it's easy to sort of say, well, I'll quit when it's done, but now's the time. There really is no time like the present. We're, we're very fortunate in living here in South Florida that we have so much open space, we have so much beautiful greenery, so we can still go outside, exercise, jog, bike, even though the gyms are closed. So sometimes it's a little easy to get discouraged. Well, my gym is closed, I can't work out. How am I gonna lose weight? But there's still plenty of things that we can do outside and still respect the social uh, distancing that is recommended. So losing weight, quitting smoking, these are all really important things to get you ready for your surgery. That's a great, oh, sorry. Great, great excuse to stop smoking. Now's the time. Absolutely. We have someone that wrote in. They were operated on a surgeon whose license was taken away shortly after and he disappeared. Their nose is, is completely messed up from the surgery that he performed. What are her options and do you offer liquid nose jobs? And this is for each of you. So the, there are lots of options there. It depends on the patient. Um, so it depends how long ago you've done the rhinoplasty was done and, and what the changes are. So in general, there's, there's a, a waiting period to see what the result is with the rhinoplasty. If things are, are really a mess or soft tissue issues, just every situation is different. Um, the, it is a nice temporizing measure. measure Not to interrupt Dr. Merrick's, but what's the timeline after you have a rhinoplasty? What's the timeline before full results set in? So, so the textbook old school verbiage is 12 months, a year. So there's two basic types of rhinoplasty. One is open, where we actually cut the clogging bell here and kind of open the hood of the car and get access to everything. So that's definitely a year or more. There's some residual swelling. Um, closed rhinoplasty, which is most of what I do, um, it involves making incisions endonasally. So the arteries and veins here are left alone. And the swelling, the original swelling can be much less, it can be six months or less. But we always tell people the rhinoplasty is evolving for a year or more. Um, when it comes to um, revisionary stuff, it just depends on the situation and the extent of rhinoplasty and then the clinical exam, how much appears to be swollen. A liquid rhinoplasty can be a good initial uh, treatment for, for a, a botched rhinoplasty, but it also can be definitive treatment. I've treated lots of people who have had a bad rhinoplasty and it's gone for years without treating it because they don't want another surgery. And we can get really long lasting and powerful results with uh, liquid rhinoplasties with the exception that we can't do reductive things. So if there's a, a piece of cartilage sticking out too far or something overdone as far as the grafting, that's a difficult thing to do without actually operating. And then whether or not we operate or wait depends on the psychological distress of the patient, the actual results, and what's going on. But. Yeah, I think, you know, especially with rhinoplasty, you know, it's, in my opinion, a very complex procedure. It's, it's one that I focus a big part of my practice in, both rhinoplasty and revision rhinoplasty. And, and revision rhinoplasty is probably one of the hardest, you know, cosmetic surgeries, in, in my opinion. Um, Unfortunately, you know, I end up seeing a lot of it uh, because a lot of people go get their rhinoplasty done at someone that doesn't do a lot or a high volume level of rhinoplasties. Um, in terms of the distinction between liquid uh, rhinoplasty or using fillers for it, um, you know, we still do them all the time and it, it's a great, you know, procedure for very specific patients. Um, most of the time it's something temporary. Some people try that out, but there's some patients that should never get a liquid rhinoplasty because they're not a good candidate for it. And, then, and that's, you know, you as a surgeon have to 
you know, provide and let them know what the best option is from that standpoint. Who wouldn't be a good candidate for a liquid nose job? So Dr. Marks mentioned a little bit about that. In general, what, what you do with a liquid uh, rhinoplasty or liquid nose job is you try to camouflage different um, areas of the nose. And what you're doing there is you're adding uh, product or volume to different areas of the nose, uh, trying to change the shape and contour. So if you have a very big nose, uh, it's very, very hard to do a liquid rhinoplasty and get a good result. However, it's still very, very uh, technical in the sense of where you put the uh, product in terms of the liquid rhinoplasty, and it really varies per patient. So it's very hard to generalize and say, hey, if you have a big nose, you can't do it, or you have a small one, you can't do it either. It just depending what you need and what you want to accomplish. Um, so it's, you know, and that's what the consultation is for, to letting, uh, you know, the patient know what's the best treatment from that. And then in terms of this specific patient or case that, that uh, uh, joined us, in terms of having a rhinoplasty done, you know, over 10 years ago, uh, she was mentioning, um, it, there is that waiting period, obviously she's passed that waiting period. And I usually wait a year after any surgical procedure on the nose to do any uh, revision from that end. And obviously you have to go to someone that does a lot of it. Sometimes we need to borrow cartilage from somewhere else because we really don't know what's been done in that nose before us. Um, whether they give you an op report or whatever, you really don't know what's available, what cartilage is available. And, you know, a nose, uh, rhinoplasty should be something that's done once in your lifetime. You know, there shouldn't ideally be any revisions. Unfortunately, we do see a lot of it. And you want to make sure that when you do your, your surgery, you get a surgeon that's well-trained in it. Uh, which is very important. And two, it's going to give you a long lasting procedure. You, gotta, you need support. There's no such thing as, oh, I'm just going to, you know, file a little bit of my dorsal hump here. It's going to look great. Don't worry about it. You're done. I hear that story five times a week, every week of patients that have rhinoplasty. I know oh, they told me it was just a little thing here. I'm done. But no, you, you know, they come back a year later. They have no support in the tip. The tip's droopy. There's irregularities. There's a cartilage and well placed it's just they're not happy with their procedure and they shouldn't be. a good rhinoplasty is one that lasts one that allows you to breathe uh, eat better or the same as before um, because there's also a functional component not just you know having a nose look attractive you got to be able to function with it and you have to be able to have a surgeon that works both of those areas and and three you got to make sure that it that it you know that procedure is only you know last for the rest of your lifetime. So you gotta make sure it's done properly. And, and I'm gonna to touch a little bit more um, about the actual quality of the surgeon. So one of the most difficult and rarest things that state Department of Health Boards of Medicines do is revoke a physician's license. The process, it's, it's almost like a trial, like a criminal trial. Um, and it's sort of like, that's the, the worst thing that a, a physician could ever have happen to them. And very unusual to have it be a one-time event. Usually it's somebody that has done, has had a lot of really bad complications, a lot of malpractice suits. Um, so in the old days, you know, the general public, it was very difficult for them to know what, who, you know, who that was, who was the bad surgeon, who was a good surgeon. But fortunately nowadays, it, all the information is available on the internet, everything, because everything is public record. Malpractice suits, uh, sanctions against license, the experience of other patients via online reviews. So th it's very difficult if patients do their research nowadays to end up in the wrong hands. So again, that goes with make sure that you do your research, you do your due diligence, to, you're choosing the person that you trust to do your surgery because we don't want people to come to us later on and say, well, I hate the way my nose came out or the way my breast came out but I had such a bad experience that I don't, want, I don't know if I want to do it again. Because if you're going to the right person, you shouldn't have to do it again. And if you do have to do it again, make sure that you're choosing the best person for you. Let's talk about social media. What value do you all find for your respective practices in social media? Um, I think it's, I mean, it's a nice forum to communicate with our patients and keep them engaged. Um, 
it's something that um, I know I'm, I'm definitely no master of. Uh, it, it gets, it, it, my experience goes through phases as far as how much that feeds my practice with patients, but it definitely serves as a way to keep stay connected with patients and uh, allows me to participate in, in more education and formerly people that are maybe wouldn't go out and request a consultation might ask a question get through your patients there. Um, so we try to have fun with it, try to share, and it's um, it's definitely an evolving thing. It's changed a lot in the past couple of years. The algorithms change and their, their revenue models change, which affects us as well. But I think for the most part, it's just a way to stay connected on a daily basis with our patient populations and our friends and family. And um, sometimes it can be great for business and sometimes just another added means of communication. So I agree with that. I think that social media has given us the opportunity to educate people as to what we do, give them insight as to what we do, what they can expect. Um, we do informative videos. We take a lot of questions. Um, we try to keep it light, sort of show, you know, show off who we are, not just as far as our skills, but also our personalities. Um, you definitely, again, want to go to a practice that uses social media as an education tool and a tool to showcase staff. You don't want to go to a practice that you look at their social media and it's all discount, 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 price, 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 and a bunch of before and afters of the patient on the operating table. So, you know, you can really gauge the quality of a practice based on their social media. Um, and if you look at something and like, well, this place looks like, the, you know, there's sort of an assembly line, you know, that's definitely a red flag. So social media is a wonderful tool. It allows us to interact with patients. It allows patients to get to know who we are before they ever come to see us and allows us to educate them as to what's, what are the current trends, what's the newest technology, new procedures. And so when they come in, they're able to ask better questions so that they're even more informed about their procedures. Yeah, I think it's a great tool both for, you know, us as surgeons and for patients in terms of education and sort of gauging what a practice looks like, as Dr. Carrega mentioned. However, you gotta still take things, you know, in context and, you know, just because the social media looks good or there's a whole bunch of followers, et cetera, doesn't mean that that surgeon is better or worse. So that's just one aspect of it. And I think it's important to, you know, not look at, you know, social media and Instagram, which we're all active in it um, and, and enjoy being part of, but I think at the same time, you shouldn't look at it as, as a new credential or the new uh, way of looking at, you know, how good your surgeon is or what their training is worth. And, and those are very different things. I think it should be an adjunct uh, to our practices. And, and, and patients do appreciate that. And, and I have fun interacting with them. And it's, it's all part of an education and a back and forth. Uh, between patients and also between surgeons. You know, we collaborate in social media and we uh, try to keep it light, but at the same time, uh, make sure we educate patients on, you know, what's best and what's safest and how we do things and give them an idea of how our practice runs. Any final words, closing statements from each of you? Stay safe, stay home, and this will be over soon. I agree. I think, I think it's just, you know, thanks for the invitation. It's been great chatting um, with all you guys and, you know, the rest of the audience, obviously. And, you know, we're here, uh, even though we're, you know, different locations and not in the office all the time, we're still available for our patients. So just, you know, whatever, whatever's needed, whatever we can help, uh, obviously, we're, we're happy to. Likewise, thanks for having us and everyone stay safe. We are available and, um, uh, everyone here is available for uh, uh, virtual consultations were easy to find um, and uh, happy to pass the time by helping educate and uh, doing our best day by day and we'll get through this and we'll build a better, better world on the other end. So thanks. Hey, so, so our attendees can contact each of you. I'm going to go one by one. We'll start with Dr. Kariaga and give us your Instagram handle. They can message you through there. So Instagram is Cariega Plastic Surgery, C-A-R-E-A-G-A, -A -A, Plastic Surgery. And uh, I'm at the, 
the Merricks Institute. So, um, or my, uh, we have two accounts, but the Merricks Institute's the main account. Um, easily find me on the, on the website as well, so the, uh, uh, email as well. So anyway. And I'm at both, you know, Carrega Plastic Surgery, as Dr. Carrega mentioned. Um, and I also have another Instagram account. It's Dr. Paul Duran, so Dr. Paul Duran. Um, and that's, you know, another account you can check out. And then, of course, via Hope Living, Hope Beauty Network. And we're, uh, we're very honored to work with all of you. It was thank really you, great Paul. getting to spend this hour together. And on behalf of Hope Living and Hope Beauty Network, thank you. Thank you for this insight and, and information and wishing everyone uh, to stay healthy and safe. Thank Likewise. you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.